I will give AEW this. They tried this week. They tried. They didn't just fill the show with a bunch of random matches or poorly set up matches or anything like that. Actually tried to nurture, develop, advance stories. Actually tried to do some different things. Tried to get us invested in characters. They tried. And I applaud the effort. Execution? Result? Nah. I personally wasn't that impressed. Uh, that doesn't mean it was terrible. I just, some of this show just didn't really jive for me. I'm sure it did for a lot of you, and that's cool. That's okay. Again, we don't have to agree on everything by any stretch of the imagination. It's actually more fun when we do disagree. Everybody just agreed all the time and said everything was great and wonderful or everything sucked and was awful. And that's no fun. Um, but, yeah, some of this just didn't really jam for me. Like, even the opening tag match with the Lucha Brothers and Jurassic Express. Now, you would expect me to come out here and be the raging Luchasaurus mark that I am. But this match, to me, is a perfect example of what are you trying to do? Who are you trying to get over? How are you trying to get them over? What type of story are you trying to tell? It just felt like we were just trying to fit in a bunch of stuff and do a bunch of spots. And it just, so some of the stuff that they did with Jungle Boy, it almost felt like he was wrestling in slow motion at times and not in a good way. And you look at the Lucha Brothers, same type of thing. Like, you know, I could kind of be hit or miss, come and go when it comes to the Lucha style. You know, when it's done crisply, it could look really, really good. When it's not and the timing is off at all or it looks a little deliberate in the wind-up setup and execution, it just really looks overly choreographed and massively fake. And that, that's kind of what I look at here. And, and I look at this type of tag match and, you know, it, they almost were using Luchasaurus too much. Like, and it seems almost sacrilegious for me to say, but you should be using hot tags to build up to him give him those big shine moments, and then get him the hell out of the way. He's not the type of character at this moment, especially in this tag team setting, that you want in there for extreme lengths of time. You know, but it, it is what it is. It's okay for TV, I suppose. This was not a pay-per-view match. Certainly was not. Uh, Jurassic Express won, and then afterwards it leads right into what I, I would best describe as continuity Kingston pro doing this really weird promo segment. Like, the Lucha Brothers are having beef, and he's trying to get them to shake hands, but all the while he's throwing shots like, where's Pac? Hey, where's your wife? Oh, maybe, perhaps very valid, fair questions. He also points out that he was never eliminated from the Casino Battle Royal. Again, a really valid point that I even forgot to talk about in the freaking review of All Out on Saturday. So you bring all these things up, but what was the point? What was the purpose of this? It's like one of these things, I'm going to check the box for the hardcore fans and mention all these continuity gaps in the story and they're going to say, yeah, that's cool, but what's the point? You got Lance Archer walking around like he's the number one contender, yet you're saying you were never eliminated in the Battle Royal, which you technically weren't, so therefore shouldn't you be coming out here talking about you're entitled to a match against Lance Archer tonight? And until you get it, you're going to shut shit down? And that match between Archer and Moxley isn't going to happen? Like, I like Eddie Kingston on the mic. Glad to see him getting some shine here in AEW, certainly. But the structure of this promo was just really weird. It was. It was a night full of promos, and some were really good, and some were like this. Just weird. Or bad. This one was just weird. Uh, the Lance Archer, Jake Roberts, short pre-tape was pretty good. I uh, wouldn't expect much much less than that. Uh, Moxley's that he had later in the night, you know, similar type of deal. Like, those are okay. You're trying to build up Archer and Moxley as a big deal, and now you've said that you're going to have that match October 14th at their one-year anniversary show, even though technically isn't their one-year anniversary October 2nd, which would, in theory, should make the October 7th show the one-year anniversary. Anyways, anyways, moving on. Uh, we get to what I think was one of the key 
things that was going to happen on the show is Matt Hardy addressing the fans. And Rebby was there. He had the, they had the young baby there. And you know, I, I talked about it on Twitter. Like, you got, you got to call it the bullshit here. You'll notice Matt did this big song and dance without directly referencing what actually happened to him. Look, if you still think because Tony Khan told you that he didn't have a concussion, that he didn't have a concussion, then you were either really, really stupid or willfully ignorant. Because Matt Hardy took a fall that could have potentially killed him. Like, and that's not overstatement here. People have died from less than that. And yet you're trying to make us believe that you had to do CT scans and MRIs, which actually don't test for concussions, but then sit there and say uh, that he didn't have a concussion? Give me a break. Now, people get concussions from getting hit in the head with the elbows and getting punches and so forth. Falling 15 feet onto the back of your head on concrete. Yeah, you didn't have a concussion, right. And then the whole thing about, well, he... When he's hurt right now and he's going to go home and he's going to get healthy. And when he gets, he's not cleared. So when he gets cleared, well, what does he have to get cleared for if he didn't have a concussion? There's no other talk of any other injury. I mean, come on, smarten up people. Smarten up. Due to that concussion, they went around the song and dance because they didn't want to make Tony Khan look bad. You know, and maybe now they're talking about, well, when he comes back, they'll, he'll take a shot at trying to become AEW world champion, which is cool. At the moment, don't really see where he fits into that picture, but you know, at some point in time, you could make a story out of that, but the whole addressing the fans thing is pretty much what I expected it to be. I, I don't know that I was expecting anything else. I just, come on, we've got to be real here. If you, if you can't see between the lines, then I, I don't know what to tell you. The dude suffered a concussion. We all damn good and well know it. Tony Khan looked like a jackass for coming out and doing the things that he did. Instead of taking responsibility, continues to duck and dive. And this promo did nothing but help him kind of duck and dive, uh, avoid and dodge. So it's whatever. Uh, then you go right into Kip Sabian and his big announcement about the best man. And you know, I don't know why I'm supposed to care about Kip Sabian or that he's marrying this heifer. I, I don't. Am I supposed to? If so, why? If so, when? Then you have a couple of people come out, the big fat dude, and then Pillman Jr. come out. They're not the best man. And the big revelation is, well, not technically, it's Miro! Yay! Going from one crappy wedding angle in WWE to another one here in AEW. Awesome! Look, I don't know how I feel about Miro and the blonde hair, but maybe it could grow on me. You know, maybe. Look, kind of looked like a twinkish bear, if you ask me. But nonetheless, nonetheless, you look at him and it feels like it's a good place where he could go. He could be something different to compare to some of the people that you have on the roster. And he gets an opportunity. You could talk about, well, here's yet another WWE guy in AEW. Well, you know, yeah, so I guess not the be-all, end-all. You could talk about him referencing the standard kind of I was at the other place for all these years and there was a glass ceiling and trying to grab for the bass ring and you can take it and shove it up your ass. Yeah, again, kind of cookie cutter, but relatable, understandable. So I don't have a ton of problem with it. I just, you're bringing in somebody like Nero. Why are you sticking them straight into this sausage fest of stupidity with Kip Sabian and this wedding crap? Like, yeah, I don't know. But he's there and that's cool. Uh, Orange Cassidy takes on Angelico, and I was really wondering, like, Orange Cassidy just beat Chris Jericho on pay-per-view on Saturday. Why is he wrestling a nobody like this here? And apparently it was just to serve as a prop to set up a parking lot brawl between the best friends and proud and powerful next week. You know, that's the thing. It, it seems great in theory to put, um, I'm sorry, Solid Monster, you know, I'm not trying to kill your push here, but the reality is you put Orange Cassidy in this spot against somebody like Jericho. Like if you're putting somebody over Jericho, you should be doing that for the purposes of making him a star, trying to elevate that person and take him to another level. But when you look at Orange Cassidy, like that whole shtick, that whole gimmick, it's more about being a gimmick guy and entertaining and having a place on the card than it is truly being like a main event player or a franchise building block at the top. 
So now you put him over Jericho, now what? And by the end of this segment, you're more focused on the parking lot brawl next week than what anything involving Orange Cassidy, and that's just ridiculous. Uh, inner circle versus jelly kisses, I would call them. Um, so, yeah. Here's what I'll say about this. Is now Jericho and Hager want to go after tag team gold? So now we're just going to add one more tag team into the mix? Like, where do they really fit in here? That's just weird. Are they just going to jump to the top of the line? I don't know. I mean, when you look at FTR and their celebration, um, it's just a lot of this show did not work for me. I'm sorry. Like, FTR is out there celebrating, and then they're talking about these different tag teams that don't get a shot. Like, what's the point of the ranking system if you're not actually going to adhere to the rankings? What's the point? Like, FTR is taking on Jurassic Express, but I believe it's a non-title match next week. Why are they taking a shot at them? Why is Jurassic Express getting a shot at them when they're not even top five in the rankings? How does that make any sense? Although, FTR, I was dirty, no, down, no good damn tricks that you did. Don't you dare be throwing napkins with freaking asteroid dust at Luchasaurus! Vengeance will be his! It's going to be a tail whip. That's what it is. Um, MJF fired the campaign staff, but more importantly, he started to tease a little bit of tension between him and Wardlow. That segment actually worked really, really well. Like I said, for a show that just kind of didn't jam and fold to me, there was stuff that was just weird and kind of, eh. Then there was some stuff that was really good. This stuff was really good. Ricky Starks coming out and pretending to be Darby Allen and then roasting on Darby Allen with Taz in there at commentary. This was really, really good. I like Ricky Starks in NWA when I had seen him, but I was looking like, hey, dude's kind of acting a little suspect. But more so, it looks like he's a dude seeking a character. He's a dude seeking a purpose. Now that you see him kind of streamlined and focused and having some type of purpose, the difference to me is night and day. And this was some really, really good stuff. Excited to see him do more of this in AEW. Um, the Adam Hangman Page and Kenny Omega sit-down interviews I thought were really well done, really well executed. You know, you have a lot of people talking about they appreciate kind of the slow burn element to this. And, and to be fair, I kind of like not rushing through every single thing. Um, but when you have the Young Bucks super kicking Alex Marvez's tapioca ass earlier in the night, and then you're having Kenny Omega talk about it's time to split off and do something singles. That's not really a heel turn to me for him, but then you're kind of insinuating the Bucks are heel. But then Paige's answers were kind of weird, but you're clearly trying to make him the baby face. Um, I appreciate the slow, the slow burn. And I in particular thought uh, the segment with Omega and JR was really, really damn good. It's probably one of the most interesting things Omega's done in this past year in AEW. Because let's be honest, folks, he ain't exactly set the world on fire. Let's just keep it real. Uh, Nyla Rose defeats Tay Conti relatively quickly. And, you know, Sheeta comes out afterwards. I guess here's my thing is, if Nyla Rose is the number one contender and has been for some time, how come she didn't get the title shot at All Out? Again, why have the rankings if you're not actually going to stick to them and use them? Uh, the big match of the night, obviously, was going to be Dustin Rhodes taking on Brody Lee for the TNT Championship. I don't think anybody expected Brody was going to lose this bell here. The match was solid. It's okay. But it was kind of weird. It was getting overshadowed to me by uh, Cody's big announcement that was coming. Not teasing tension in the dark order. Not anything like that. I was worried, wondering, like, what kind of stupidity did he have this be? My brother just got beat up and he lost his match. So as the little brother, let me focus on my shit again. Let me get my stuff in. If that doesn't talk about sibling relationships, I don't know what the hell does. But Cody's big announcement. Like, to me, this was the creme de la crap on this night. It's the go big show. So now you know why he was hurt and why he took some time off. Because he had to go shoot a reality show with Rosario, da Rosario Dawson, some token white heifer singer, and Snoop Dogg. Captain Capitalism himself. <laughs> so his big announcement, 
was to tease his appearance on technically another network show. Assume Cody position! Does anybody think that show actually looked good? What do you think of Cody's big announcement? Tell me in the comments, please. God, I gotta hear this. It's like, hey, I, I, I can't knock the hustle here. They're trying to pretend like Cody's a big deal, so they're trying to give him exposure on this different network, this different show, try to get people interested in him, so by association they might come over. I get it, like, it's worth a shot, but... <laughs> Chances this show lasts more than six or eight episodes? <laughs> what is this big announcement? <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that just kind of perfectly epitomizes Dynamite this week. Like, there was legitimately some good stuff. There was. The promos from Archer and Jake and Moxley, good. The segment with MJF and Wardlow, very good. The sit-downs with Omega and Paige, pretty damn good. There was good stuff. Ricky Starks. A lot of the promo stuff was good. The matches, eh. Miro being announced. Of course, he has to be put right back into a wedding angle. But hey, you know what? He's there. And that's where he belongs. And I'm happy to see him. It's going to be Happy Miro Day. And if I had some tape, I would have put Miro over it, damn it. You know, and at least even Matt Hardy. His promo was real, it was relatable, it was connectable, you could get emotionally behind it. But, but there were plenty of misses on this show. Like, it, it misfired to me somewhat. It absolutely did. I feel like this review kind of misfired. But nonetheless, you can let me know what you thought about AEW in the comments below. Remember, this is OTRS Central, not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need, because I'll give it to you straight as I see it, regardless of how much you're going to rage against me with your flaming keyboard fingers of fire. See you later.